Okay, thanks for staying with us. It's time to go to the press and see what the headlines are on some of our national daily, uh, beginning with the business NG. But we're being joined by Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a public affairs analyst. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning, my brother. Thanks for having me. Mm. Okay. Um, we're starting with the business NG this morning. And the first story here... Uh, bleak outlook for Nigerian economy in late 2024, experts say. Uh, that means uh, as the year winds down, we might be seeing worst in our economic, sp in economic space. So I don't know. That's what the headlines on Business NG say, that, that the experts are saying. So I give that to you. The economy will get worse. Hello? Oh, they say th there's a bleak outlook for Nigerian economy in late 2024, uh, according exactly, to experts. Exactly, exactly. Mm. You know, you don't need uh, any expert advice or opinion to be able to predict that the economy is going to get worse. And I start by pointing out that uh, look at the state of our food security. One has not seen any serious effort being made. To ensure that the nation has a good security, that we turn things around in that area. Inflation has continued to go up. Food is very, very expensive and rare to come by. The quality of the food that we also get is not compared to what we are used to as, as, as a nation. And uh, the agricultural sector is come at us, just like the manufacturing sector. Even though we have been told that the tariffs and taxes on certain food items are going to be waived, and that the federal government will embark on a massive importation of certain food items. Those are, those are palliative. It doesn't solve the problem in the long, long run. What who solve the problem in the long, long run, it's like what the man in Niger said, the government in Niger said is free. Mm. And which has gotten from Estad, purchased a lot of agricultural equipment, and they are training farmers on now to cultivate the land and get improved uh, and yield. If the bandits, the Bokwaram, and all that, will not hamper that man's effort, then something positive will come in that area. Mm. That is a template that the federal government could also employ. It is also a template that some of the, the state governments will also employ, and even the local government. And then uh, we move from there to manufacturing. More and more companies are moving out of Nigeria and on a daily basis. Mm. If the economy is going to be food, we will have seen an abatement of that massive relocation of a manufacturing company out of Nigeria. And let also look at uh, the petroleum sector. Even though the price is relatively stable now, when you find that there isn't any significant improvement in the quantity that the nature produces and all that. And even production of the petroleum products, with somebody like Angote as the the man is complaining that he is being sabotaged, that they are not supplying enough food oil to be able to produce. And recently, too, there was a fire outbreak in that plant. Mm. This looks like a sabotage. And I can recollect the former governor of uh, the state. Now it's cynical. People recommend it that whoever sabotage, I mean, uh, that whoever sabotage uh, the Dangote refinery and some other refineries that are trying to, that are coming on stream, should have death penalty as their recompense. So these are the indices. Unemployment is going higher, higher on the daily basis, insecurity, kidnapping. You actually could move a hundred million. I mean, uh, you actually could move 
five kilometers in different parts of the country today without fearing that you might be kidnapped or killed by bandits. So I agree with the what the Nigerian citizens there have said that the future looks looks mm. very, very black. Oh, well. the end of the year and then the next year. So now everybody is struggling, and, and that's why even there's a headline of the survival mode, Nigerian students re resort to hustling. So in order for you to go to school, you have to hustle, no matter what, because your parents, even if you have parents that will cater to that your, those your educational needs, uh, you still need to hustle because your parents will, may not even have enough. And then there are things exactly. that you meet, needs that you need to meet at school and all that. It's unfortunate. Um, it is, it is. But meanwhile, they are saying that Nigeria foreign reserves surge to $34.66 billion, highest in over a year. So we're talking about foreign reserves surging and then the, people, the people's livelihood going down. I don't know how, how the relationship is, how, they, how that we can even mm. talk about this. Mm. Is it to our advantage or not? When they say the foreign reserve is going up, the question to ask yourself is uh, can it meet the importance of the country? Or what is the percentage of the rise in foreign exchange reserves and the foreign quality needs of the country? Me and I would agree that the reserves we have now, if we have to import and do business with other foreign countries, if they have to allow some of the foreign companies that are still in Nigeria repatriate whatever profit they are making, you will find out that the result is going up. It's mere token, it doesn't solve the problem at all. It's neither here nor there. Yes, it is good that it is going up, but when you look at the ratio of its rights compared to import needs of the country, you and I wouldn't be jubilating. We wouldn't be jubilating at all. Mm. We have received already domestic uh, debt. We have received already the cost of governance. We have received already ostentatious living styles of the politicians. We have received already the cost of governance. And until we do this, all this talk about uh, rising funding and saving earnings is a mere uh, propaganda. In my own opinion, we need to do the needful at all. Let's address the challenges at all first. And then all other things in terms of funding and saving earnings will be added to it. I was reading from journal, and the journal did a very beautiful analysis as to what the Dangote refinery could be contributing to funding and saving any for the country. If that refinery is allowed to perform, if people will not support it, if people would uh, do the needful in terms of supplying that refinery with sufficient crude product to be able to manufacture. We think that the man is an alarm. I haven't seen any positive reform, reform from the petroleum minister or even from the presidency. But the presidency is the one supposed to address that issue. Why do I say this? The petroleum sector is the commanding height of our economy. It is an area in which the presidency should show special interest on a daily basis. But the president is the, the minister of petroleum. So... It's not just that they should show uh, seriousness. They are, it's, he, they are in charge. He is also Minister of Petroleum. Mm. So, this is the one we are saying. So, a lot needs to be done. It will appear to me that they are already thinking too much about the election in 2027. That they are lying too many things to flip through their hands. They are lying too many people get away with the undermining and sabotage of the Nigerian economy. Mm -hmm. And a nation in which uh, personal interest overrides the uh, national interest, your guess is as good as mine. Mm. 
Well, talking about national interest, uh, suspend Samoa agreement, uh, reps tell uh, Nigerian government. You see the, the go back and forth that has been on the press and everywhere else about the Samoa agreement. There's a critical um, provision in the Samoa agreement which a lot of people are not very comfortable with, and that is uh, the LGBTQ uh, factor. Uh, so some people are arguing that it was not directly spelled out and others are saying there's a clause that can be exploited by whoever wants to make a case. So why would a government like Nigeria sign an agreement uh, that go, goes against the constitution of Nigeria, the tenets, the, the, the values of Nigeria and everything like that? So the reps have said, okay, let us uh, scrutinize this document suspend it in the meantime and all that. But it has been signed already. So I, I don't know. Let me ask you this, not in your capacity as a public affairs analyst, but in your capacity as a lawyer. You have a constitution yes. that says uh, something, and then you go to sign an agreement that um, says something different from what your constitution holds. Can your constitution protect you uh, against this foreign body that gave you that kind of a loan? predicated on a particular condition? You see, my brother, a beggar has no choice. When you are popularized, when you are poor, when you have become a beggar, whatever they put on your table, you lap it up. That is a dilemma that Nigeria is facing today. Every cobalt that can be earned, taken in terms of foreign labor and grants, in terms of foreign loans and what as well. This country is desperate to have it. So when religion is ethical people begin to talk about this LGBT thing, LGBT thing, I'm not I'm not too sure that it is going to strike a chord with the people in government. They need every couple that can come from anywhere to be able to stay afloat. So all this Puritanism, about all this ethics, about LGBT and what have you, I'm not too sure we make any difference to them. Yet, when you look at the current laws of the land, the criminal law, the penal code, and even the constitution, it stands at LGBT activities and what have you. And the dominant religions in this country, which is Christianity and Islam, also found, even the, 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 the traditional religious found as the LGBT activities. But the truth of the matter, presently, is that uh, people's sexual preferences is no longer a big issue around the world. For Nigeria, to start fighting or to stop LGBT activities is like swimming against the current. I'm not too sure we can win that. Why the Caucasian people, or why the white people, or why the uh, Europeans and Americans and all that have embraced the LGBT activities, I really don't know. But it would appear to me that they are trying to use it to control the population exclusion that is going on around the world. Reconnect. But even President Muhammad Bukhari, who is a conservative, recently came out and said we need to control our population. That the rate at which the population is exploding, we might not be able to manage it. But is that, a good, is that a good argument to allow... In economics, we have something we call a, a opportunity cost, what you need to give up in yeah. order to achieve something else. Will the, cost, uh, of, will the cost not be too much if Nigeria goes and does what, what, what Nigerians in general have, have kicked against? Will the cost not be too much for us? Let, let, let me... I will pose this hypothetical question. What injuries does LGBT activities inflict on the society other than ethical issues? It is just uh, one man, uh, one, I mean, just uh, two people who are probably inflicting uh, injuries on themselves and who are engaging in unhygienic sexual activities and all that. 
when you look at the bigger picture, the wider administrations are northern. I'm not too sure that LGBT activities inflict serious injuries on the society. Or even the transgender activities that Bobrisky does. The people in government, the politicians, who are still the billions of naira on the daily basis, who are located as a substantial chunk of the nation's resources to be able to inflict, I mean to be able to live for sensational life. Are they not inflicting more injuries on the society than the transgender people and then the LGBT people? Well, they, yeah, there's, really. there's an, if, you, if that's the argument, there's an emotional, emotional injury that is being inflicted. For instance, if a father has a child and the child is up to 18 years and he decides to marry the child, what injury will it have on the society? Nothing whatsoever. It's two people oh, who are adults enjoying themselves. But the society will be inflicted this injury of the emotion. So the society will kick against incest. So if we talk about physical injury or anything, we should also consider emotional injury that it will, make, it will have on the people. And that is what will give rise to, to, uh, to, to demonstrations here and there. We've seen people being burnt alive in the north because they uttered a word, just a word. They didn't cut anybody. They didn't, they didn't do anything to anybody. But they have uttered a word that is against their emotional uh, well-being. And so... We are seeing all this. So if we say there's no injury, in the physical maybe, but in, in, in the subconscious, in the emotional space, there is an injury. So will that be a, a strong argument? Yeah, there is an injury. I, I, I agree with you. But the, uh, how do I put it? The, when you look at the injury that is inflicted, compared to some other injuries, I know that. It appears to be significant. Incest is a different thing. That one has a bigger ramification than what else is. When two people have the same DNA test, begin to reproduce uh, or begin to make babies and what else is. Scientists have been able to prove that children that come from such uh, activities tend to have uh, some DNA deficiency, some um, physiological deficiencies, which make them prone to being perennially sick and then having to use our city facilities, having to depend on drugs uh, for so many of the ailments that they suffer from. At the end of the day, it is a society that will be picking the bills that for children will be extended to make sure that they live and to make sure that they enjoy at least some modicum of a, a good health. Furthermore, such forces are not likely to be productive economically. A man who has to go to hospitals on a daily basis, who is uh, ever sick, you and I will agree that they can add little or nothing to the economy. That would appear to me to be the difference. LGBT activity doesn't lead to production of children. They just merely engage in uh, very unhygienic sexual activity. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, well, <laughs> that, that will be matter for another day, Mr. Kolawole. Uh, let's go to uh, another issue here. We're moving to a different newspaper, by the way. Um, this time we're going to um, the Nation newspaper. Um, the, the lead, this is not the leading headline I want to take right now. Uh, what I'm going to look at is um, Ministry of, um, what are they even saying? Federal government to, uh, federal government gets Ministry of Livestock Development. Ministry of Livestock, Livestock Development. Uh, so now we are, we're looking at a, an even wider cabinet uh, where we were already talking about a cabinet that is the biggest since independence. Uh, we're going to have a wider cabinet. So it, was this necessary? Um, I don't know. They, they, the argument is that it's going to stop the header farmer clashes and so they're having a new ministry of livestock development. 
what happens to Ministry of Agriculture? My brother, life force development has always been in the midst of agriculture. And I remember in those days, they were very, very active. They go to the different uh, full and settlements to humanize, uh, to humanize cows, goats, sheep, and what have you. They also help the hackers to improve on their yield and what have you. So what they are talking about is nothing new. It has always been there. And in a situation in which you said you want to cut out the cost of government, you want to reduce the number of ministries. In fact, a few weeks ago we are told that the federal government has begun to implement the Orosan Yehwe report yeah. or recommendation mm -hmm. quietly. And that is going to lead to the closure of ministries and parastatus and reduction in the weight B of the federal government. So if you are doing that, and when you already have a department in the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, why will you be establishing another ministry? We already have more than enough ministers. More than enough ministers in the different places. In fact, this government has appointed the, the highest number of ministers since they returned to Siburu, since, since they the Third Republic. So, to me, we just merely picking one hole and covering it back. It doesn't solve the problem. This country, this government requires to employ very drastic policies and programs to really address the challenges that the Nigerian economy is facing. Also remember, there has been this uh, uh, call for us to create ranches all over the country. But I haven't seen any sincerity in that area. And I'm particularly bitter with the Yoruba leaders, especially the governors in Yoruba land, who have been saying they will not allow the full and person to have any ranches in their domain. Look, I come from a village in Kuala State, and I am a very old man now. I met the full and neat person living side by side with us in my village. My mother also told me they have always been there. My father told me they have always been there. My grandmother told me they have always been there. My grandfather told me they have always been there. So if this be the case, people have been living in the place for more than 100 years. Why would you be discriminating against them? What we should all do? Anywhere there is a full and settlement, anywhere there is a other settlement, anywhere in Nigeria, the government in those places, whether in Yoruba, whether in Ebola, whether in the north or in the south, to establish, to help those full and people, create and establish. Like this, you don't have to start driving the full and people back to Nigeria Republic or to the northern part of the country because you erroneously believe. They have no place in your own community, or they don't belong to your community. I have always said the full animal is an asset. If it's captive is well managed, you get nothing or meat from there. If it's uh, anchors are well managed, milk will come from there. If they cattle, if they cattle or the ranches are well managed, eyes and skin will come from there. And different other products that we can really tax the government. And the greater profit for the full and man. And employment will be created. And you, you know what? There is nothing stopping a Yoruba man from having his own ranches. There is nothing stopping an Igbo man from rearing cactus. Just like the area ticket, just like the area uh, pigs. Who told some of these people that the cactus rearing is the exclusive preserve of the full and man? Man, that is not uh, a positive thinking. Okay, well, um, I don't know the history. I don't know the, the experience that uh, these Yoruba leaders you are talking about. 
uh, have had with them, so I cannot argue with them. Uh, but one thing is for sure, if ranches are encouraged, other ethnicities will go into ranching as my well. Brother, my brother, they, they will go into my brother. Uh, ranching as well. My brother, maybe what they fear, what be, maybe what they fear yeah. is the Goshen of nowadays, because uh, there are some people who have a tendency of of trying to conquer the land that does not belong to them. And if there are ranches, I'm not sure that um, there will be no space in the north that can can hold all the cattle that I, we're talking about because ranches will require yeah. food that will not need to be grown uh, widely so we can have we can have the hay come from the south to the north we can have ranches everywhere that one is a fact i agree with you you see what is happening in nigeria is not peculiar to nigeria alone migration has become a problem in different parts of the world and why are people migrating? They are migrating for greener pastures, for better life. Nobody wants to live in a society or in an environment in which he cannot realize his potential, his ambition as a human being. It is not the full animal that is migrating alone that is migrating to the south of Nigeria. The Yoruba people, the Igbo people, the Delhi people, the Alpha people, they're going to Europe, they're going to America and other we they will never come back. And the election has just been concluded in, uh, in Britain about a week or two ago. Two made about six or seven Nigerians contested an election in Britain and got elected into the British Parliament. So, if the white people, if the Europeans, if the, if the British people are discriminating against those people, would they have had the opportunity to be elected? into the British Parliament. The previous election on your party contested to be British Prime Minister. And I think it's sort of what and all that. And we must also remember one thing. All over the world, people tend to, to migrate from the Irish region to the coastal region. That is why the population in the coastal in the coastal region, in most parts of the world, is usually thicker, is usually larger, is usually bigger. People want comfort. If you talk about the ability, the full animal trying to conquer somebody else's land, and you think that is because people are refused to accommodate them, they fight for their own survival. You know, they fight for their own survival. If you accommodate them, and like I said, if our people, if the different government, the different parties, of the federation, no matter where they come from, we help them to establish. Uh, cattle ranches in the different domains that they are based and all that. I am sure some of the conflicts that we are having now will not be there. You are yeah. finding the different governors. I, 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 support, I, I support the ranches. I support the ranches. I'm, I support and the ranches. I'm saying, I'm saying that. Well, I support the ranches. All I'm saying is that if we have ranches even, we may not need to have these migrations here and there because there will be enough land, there will be enough food for the cattle and all that. And the species of cattle might also change as well, but they're not thinking around uh, that. Um, it's unfortunate that even in the National Assembly, there are some people, there are some senators who should be very learned, should, that, that will stand up and say it is natural that the Fulani man has to migrate, so it's part of his, his culture, so we should let them migrate. Whether they can find whatever they need in a particular place or not, I think that's a poor argument because, for instance, Erufa is Fulani, isn't he? Um, Buhari is Fulani, isn't he? They don't migrate because they have reached a particular uh, station in life that they know that migration is not everything. Everything they want is in one place. So it doesn't mean as if their blood will boil and they will die if they don't move from place to place. It's just that they have not been told something else. Something different from what they I agree with know. you. My yes. brother, I agree with you. I hope we get to that point though. Look at the education, look at the education of uh, Rufai, look at the education of Buhari and the opportunities that they have in life. Mm -hmm. Does the average full and big boy, does the average full and big girl have such opportunities? They have not been told, we they have not been, been given. That's stop, the thing. We would have been able to stop this migration if we have been able to fight desert encroachment in the northern part of the country. Look yeah. at the billions of men that have gone down. 
So we should be talking the, about education, the, not, not, not that they should be moving the from place to place. For the anyway. people here in that area, mm. so we are our own enemies. I'm not too sure that the full animal derives enjoyment in just one way around the country. Mm. The victims of our, of, 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 uh, our inability to organize ourselves, to make sure that we do the needful. Israel, an arid country, has turned the desert into arable land. So if Israel is able to do it, mm. what stops us being able to do it itself? Yeah. Some of the best uh, food items you, you, you get from Israel now. And that is a desert. So if we have been able to fight desert encroachment, and the full animal has access to his gra the to grasses for his cattle, I'm not too sure if you wander all over the country the way they do better than Who told exactly. you that the full animal doesn't like comfort, doesn't like want to live a good life? Exactly. He doesn't want to stay in one place and mm. train his children to become doctors, uh, scientists, and aeronautical engineers. I, I think I, I blame the elites within the within the northerners. Uh, they are the ones who, in the time of Jonathan, when they were talking about Almajiri schools, some of them opposed it and said that it was it was in their DNA that um, they will have to go out and beg. It's a religious thing. They they need to go out and beg. So so yeah. So that's that's why that's why I'm saying I blame the elites within the the, the, the ranks. The second school that I went, there were so many full and people who are my classmates. Mm. They did well in school. True. In fact, there's a particular one. I think we made a one in about nine or seven subjects. Okay. Well. That's the yeah. much we can take today on the on of the press, Mr. Kola Wole. Uh, we'll leave the rest Thank for the people so to read. Thank you so much for being a part mm -hmm. of our show. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Have it's a wonderful another day. It's another thing that delights uh, can you return this program. Yeah. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. We've been talking with Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a public affairs analyst who is also a legal practitioner. He was speaking to us uh, from Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, we're going to take a short break and return with our first hot topic. Stay with us.